my name is Maury, um, and as Jeff mentioned, I'm uh, an author. My recent book, Managing the Millions, Practical Human Resource Management in China, uh, is an e-book. And if, if you're not familiar with e-books, speak to Sophie from Amazon. She'll be able to point you in the right direction. Um, my first book being Selling Big to China. Selling Big to China um, was a book focusing mostly on sales, and I know some of you here um, are responsible for building sales. It's, a, it's in English, but it is talking about how to build strong sales teams. Um, and that was published through John Wiley and Sons, and is occasionally available at international airports, uh, but certainly again on Amazon. So today's topic is a combination of both of my skill sets. So on the one hand, I come from a very strong sales background. I'm a former pharmaceutical salesperson. Uh, Frederick, I used to work for a French company called Sanofi, Sanofi Aventus, and, um, and I was working in sales in pharmaceutical. And uh, I, when I came to China 12 years ago, I developed the company from the, from the ground up. And of course, the first department you create is the sales department. Uh, because obviously there's no tax to be paid if you don't make a sale. So accounting comes second. That experience over the last 12 years and then moving, uh, growing the business and having negotiations internally with my staff, we've grown to as big as 84 full-time staff and re reduced that to a more manageable 30 full-time staff more recently, um, has given me a great experience in negotiating in China with Chinese and not just in Shenzhen, but also in other cities, including uh, mostly Shanghai and Beijing. Um, and then the other half of my experience is, um, is through the, the, the HR background. So the magazine Network HR, uh, which you will have picked up at the, the desk, Network HR was my um, baby that I created eight years ago. And Ultimately, it ended up being a, a standalone product. So initially, it was really just the marketing department. It was going to be just for advertising, but it ended up being a very important um, uh, document and regular feature of the HR calendar. And a lot of HR people started to give me feedback, and, and we're now in our 39th issue, 39 issues later. Um, so I'm very proud of that. And then that became the book Managing the Millions, which was published um, only a, about uh, two months ago. So um, the combination of my sales negotiation and my human resource HR background has led to today's topic, which is, is everything in China negotiable? And I wrote an article in the most recent issue of Network HR, number 38, and I said, well, is everything negotiable? I mean, that's a very big number, isn't it? Everything. It's, uh, it's infinite. So I, I kind of brought it back to reality and I brought it back to the issues that are facing HR. Before I talk about the three areas, I'm going to give you just a small overview of where we are today here in China, whether that's Shanghai, whether that's Weizhou, whether that's Shanghai or Beijing. The statistic that you can see on my left uh, comes from Roland Berger. And Roland Berger is a, a consulting firm, and they have said that turnover within China on average is 19%. So if you have 100 staff every year, 19%, 19 people will leave the organization. 100 people, 19 will leave. I mean, that is an entire department. Could be two departments, couldn't it? You know, that could be your entire finance department, your entire R&D department, your entire sales department. So it's an enormous number, an enormous number. And we compare that to the average world number of 4%. One of the uh, positive side effects of the global financial crisis was the reduction in turnover of staff around the world. Because people suddenly realised that their jobs were not secure. And they were not going to take career risks because they honestly did not know whether they would be re-employed uh, sometime, sometime down the line. But that, that uh, global financial crisis, that mentality has never hit the Chinese employee 
to date. And then that's great news. That's good news. It's great news for uh, Li Keifu and, uh, and, and, and all these business people who are building great companies, right? Uh, Ma Yun, who are building these, these great businesses, because it means if people are employed, then they have money to spend on products. Um, but it adds a problem for HR. And the HR problem is that we do have this high turnover. But this high turnover is not stable. It's not 19% spread over 12 months. According to jowpin.com, there is a spike. And that spike is now. It is directly after the Chinese New Year. The Chinese New Year being at any time, of course, February, sometimes January, sometimes March. Directly after Chinese New Year, there is a spike of resumes on jowpin.com. So what are they doing? The employees are either long-term and they're currently employed and they put their resume onto Jalpin, hoping that in the next few months they'll be able to move jobs. Or they're short-time focused, a lot, a lot of people are, and they've already quit their job and now they've decided, well, I better look for a new job. I can only last so long on my 13th month bonus. So there's the problem. We have a jump at this time of year with regard to employee turnover right now. And so that's why you're here today. I'm here today to help you with the next uh, couple of weeks to a month or so, particularly in this area. So I'm going to cover three areas today. And it comes from the article in Network HR. And the first area is selling of ideas. Selling of ideas. HR are salespeople. Now, I've been in sales, as I mentioned, with Aventus, Sanofi, Sanofi, Aventus. I've been in sales for 18 years. I was 18 years old when I started my first company. So actually, I've been in longer, longer than 18 years, now, almost 20 now. So 18 years I've been in sales. And one thing that I know about sales is that salespeople have a bad name, a bad reputation, don't we? Right? We, we get the bad reputation because actually salespeople are the most underqualified people in an organization. Right? Salespeople are the most underqualified in any organization. If you are an accountant, what did you study? Accounting. If you're an engineer, what did you study? Engineering. And if you're a salesperson, what did you study? Could be anything. For me, it was Wei Xiang Wu, microbiology. And some of the people in the room who may have touched on sales before may be something equally as irrelevant. Yeah, so salespeople are actually very, very highly underqualified. And consequently, over the years, salespeople have really created a bad name for the word sales. But unfortunately, it still stands that you have to sell. You have to sell new ideas, and I'll come to that in a minute. The second part I'm going to look at is on helping others reach agreement. China is a her share country, right? Harmony, harmonious. If you, uh, I, I live in Shanghai, I'm based in Shanghai for the last 12 years, and I live in Jing'an, which is the her share uh, district. It has a big temple. Um, when I travel to Beijing, I take the 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 he, uh, the train, the fast train, uh, right? The, and that's a the, the name of the train has he peace in it. Um, formerly Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao. Every every few minutes, when the, when they were speaking, the word harmony he share would come out. He share is very important. But what a lot of people forget is that her share is not not doing anything. Her share is not putting your hands up and saying, I'm not getting involved. Her share is about maintaining stability. And sometimes stability means that you need to help others with their conflict. Avoiding conflict does not necessarily maintain, uh, uh, maintain stability, as we've seen um, around the world over the hundreds of years of war. So HR needs to understand that you are part of the Hershey, the harmony, but you need to get involved. You need to get your hands dirty, so to speak. And I'll come to that a little bit later. 
And the last area I'll talk about, I'll give away some secrets. Cliff, I'll uh, share some of the secrets that HR can use to reduce the cost of your vendor purchases, whether that's a recruitment firm, headhunting, whether that's training or management consulting, or whether that's uh, any aspect of your job, I will teach you how to reduce the cost because $1 made is not as much as $1 saved, right? $1 made is minus tax. Tax on, on average is around about 5%. So if you make one dollar or one yen, you're not making one dollar, you're making 95 thin. But if you save one dollar or save one yen, the government does not tax you on that savings, do they? So as an HR department, you should be very proud of your savings because savings are more valuable than money earned, as long as you continue to earn money overall. Okay, let's begin. So I'm going to talk now about selling of ideas. And um, through my work with Network HR, I have a great, great privilege to be able to interview very senior people around China about recruitment. And one thing that came up uh, last year when I was writing an article called uh, 10 Ways to Reduce Your Employment Costs, I came across this this scenario and, and a number of recruitment and HR professionals told me this scenario. We have a picture here of uh, two gentlemen. One of the men is the line manager, the line manager. You can, you can tell who that is. He's the man with the tie and the disinterest. He has no interest in being there. He's got his Coca-Cola. The man with no hair, the bald man, he's the candidate. Yeah, uh, we know this. Now, what happened to lead up into this picture? What happened prior to this scenario? How do we end up with this in this situation? <clears throat> well, um, headhunting and recruitment is incredibly popular in China. By comparison, recruitment and headhunting is outsourced more in China than it is done in other countries. Enormous, enormous. I mean, we can we can cut our costs just by cutting recruitment uh, outsourcing, but that's another issue. What has happened? Well, first of all, the line manager has said, I need more staff and there's a time to fill. And that time to fill uh, may vary. It may be maybe weeks, it may be months in some cases. And the HR manager has probably gone on to jiaopin.com, 51 job, uh, other, other websites. They may have also outsourced some of the headhunting uh, capability. And the headhunter and the HR person go through the candidates, do the preliminary interviews, and then they create a short list. And from that short list, the line manager chooses a few people to interview. And this is where we are. The candidate is invited into your company. They are met by the HR department. Maybe there's the headhunter there as well. But typically the HR will be there. They are introduced to the line manager. They sit down. And then the line manager, with a very similar expression, destroys all your hard work by one simple question. And what is that question? The question is, why do you want to work for us? The candidate looks confused. The candidate looks at the line manager, looks at HR. If there's a recruiter, looks, looks at the headhunter and says, what do you mean? I've already got a job. You've invited me here. Why do you want me? And immediately, there is a breaking of goodwill. There is a destruction of all that hard work that you've put in. Because the line manager is simply doing an administrative job. They're simply going through the tick box function. Now, it's interesting, we've got a few people, uh, TCL and Lenovo, we've got some IT and technology companies here today. And Aon Hewitt last year came out with a, uh, a, a survey specifically on IT and technology companies. And they found that of interviews in, in this industry, 15%, sure, 15% of offer letters that are given to candidates are rejected. 
That's right. 15% of candidates who go through all that effort of headhunting, screening, invitations, come into the office, sit down, 15% of those people will say, no thank you, I don't want to join your company. So remember, China has a turnover of 19%. It's very high, and that's an average, right? So it could be higher in your department, your industry. 19% of your turnover. And then we have this horrible 15% of inefficiency in replacing those 19%. So we have a really high turnover of staff, and then we're not very good at replacing those 19%. So what can you do? Well, you can help sell the idea. So if you're in HR, make sure that you brief the line manager beforehand. Clearly this line manager is not interested in his job of interviewing and recruiting. Clearly, this is a horrible first impression for a candidate, particularly someone who is of high calibre, someone you have headhunted. So it's important for you to sell the idea, to make sure the line manager is, is, is selling your, your business, is highlighting the strengths of joining the company, Ex explains how exciting the business is and how excited he or she is with inviting the candidate to join your company. So that's right, HR needs to be salespeople. So that's the first part of sales. Second part of sales is a bit of a story from my homeland, Australia. Peaches, peaches, canned peaches. Australia has a, has a culture of putting things in cans and storing them away uh, for various reasons. And uh, mostly because it's very hot and early on there was no refrigeration. So there is a whole industry in the state of Victoria, where I'm from, Melbourne, Murban is the capital city of, uh, where they grow a lot of fruit. And the, one of the oldest peach, uh, sorry, canneries, the companies that can products, is the SPC company, Shepparton Packaging Company. And Shepparton is a town, is a town. Um, by Chinese standards, it's uh, more, like a, uh, more like a traffic light, I guess. Uh, but it's a very, very important town in, in, in relation to agriculture. And over the last uh, almost 100 years, since 1914, the SPC company has been employing over a thousand Australians in this area. And this is hiring a thousand primary uh, employees. Of course, those primary employees, they have wives or husbands, they have children, and they add to the local community by, by paying rent, by going to schools, by purchasing products from the shops in the, in the town. And Shepparton is a very large city in this region. But in the 1990s, there was a problem. The company was going into bankruptcy. They had 720 million renminbi of bankruptcy. Now that's a tiny number compared to, say, companies like Suntech more recently. But 720 million renminbi is a lot for a small town. All those thousands of employees and the secondary jobs created by those primary employees were going to be affected. An entire town could have turned into a ghost town. Yeah, very serious. And there was a problem. The board of directors fired the general manager and a new general manager was appointed. <clears throat> and he had a very strong HR background. And he formed a new senior management. And the first thing he did was he sold the idea. He sold the idea that together we are going to save the company and therefore save your jobs. Every week, his team of senior managers would sit down with, with everybody, one-on-one, -on -one, in small groups and in town hall-style meetings, and would explain the process, very transparent, of what they were doing to restructure the company to avoid uh, increasing debt and to reduce that debt to manageable numbers and ultimately turn the company around. Well, the picture that you, that you can see is a, is a new picture, so the, the story ends very happily. The company today is very strong, it's healthy. At one time, in a meeting, it was proposed that staff, those thousands of staff, would reduce their own salary so no one else was fired. 
No one else was fired. Now, thankfully for the unions, that didn't happen. The unions said, no, hang on, you can't reduce salaries. We've fought very hard. The unions are very strong in Australia. Um, but the good news was the idea was sold so well that the people themselves were on board and the company today survived. Now, take into consideration some recent news in China. Think of companies like Foxconn. Think of companies, um, for example, the Japanese companies of Nissan and Toyota. Think of companies up in Shanghai, there's a, a Shishetsu, which is a Japanese manufacturing company, where the 18 senior managers, both Japanese and Chinese, were surrounded by 400 angry employees for two days. Why? Because the toilet break policy had changed. The toilet break policy had changed and they had a mutiny and police had to come in and pull these 18 people out. And one of the men collapsed. He had uh, heart palpitations. He almost died. And that was over a toilet break. They didn't sell the idea very well, did they? And yet SBC was able, able to cut the costs of people's salaries. That's how you sell ideas. So HR is so important because we're not always going to enjoy 8.7% growth. We're not always going to have fantastic returns. We're not always going to hit our KPIs and our sales targets. Some days we're going to have to cut costs. And of course, the biggest cost is often our employees. So that's the first level, and that's selling of ideas. Let's now move on to the second half, or second part, we have three parts, helping others reach agreement. Um, now, one of the key parts of my book, Selling Big to China, was this image here. This is the funnel. And the funnel, I actually learned when I was working for Sanofi Aventus. And this, the funnel is a way that you think about how you ask questions. You see, when we go to school, all of us here on average have gone to school for 16 years. The age of six to the age of 22 or 23. For 16 years, roughly, we get told the answers and we answer the question, but we don't ask the questions. That's what the teacher does, right? So for 16 years, we don't learn how to ask questions. And that's one of the reasons why salespeople have such a bad name, right? Because they need to learn how to ask questions. And so we get a job, wherever that may be, and we start assuming. Because that's what we do at school, isn't it? We guess. We know the answer, we don't know the answer, or we guess. If we ask, what's that called? It's called cheating, isn't it? Hey, do you know the answer? Ah, oh, no. It's called cheating. So for 16 years, we learn how not to work because we don't learn how to ask questions. So I have um, provided you with a, a rundown of how you need to ask questions. And as it suggests, in a funnel, we start big and we end small. If you have this magazine, I'm going to read directly from it. You may wish to, to open to page 35. On page 35, at the very bottom, you can see um, a little script. Now, I'm going to read it as two characters here. Uh, the two characters, one is HR professional, and the other is the candidate. Now, there's a dispute. We've got a problem. Someone is not happy with the bonus that they've received. Could be any time this year. And uh, HR is getting involved to try to mitigate or resolve the problem. So I'll read this um, and then I'll explain this to you. The HR person says, So I understand that you are disappointed with your recent salary, salary review. Tell me your concern. I'll say that again. So, you, so I understand that you are disappointed with your recent salary review. Tell me your concern. Now tell me your concern is an open, non-leading question. What's an open question? Open? What? Why, when, how, which, who, and tell me about. Tell me about. Uh, if you'd like to, uh, Callie's going to come out and, and give you the magazine, which you may have missed on entering. Now, this is an open question. Page 35, if you turn to this. 
An open, non-leading question. Now, what's a non-leading question? A non-leading question is where you're not telling the person what the theme or the topic is. You're leaving it open for them to talk about. Tell me your concern. That's a really important question. Because we don't know. We can't assume. And I've been in sales for over 18 years, and I don't assume. I simply ask questions. The candidate then replies, I didn't think that the pay rise recognised the contribution that I have made to the company this year. I didn't think that the pay rise recognised the contribution that I have made to the company this year. What's the need here? What is the feeling that is being shown by this, by this employee who has missed their bonus? Well, as you can see on page 35, the need is recognition. Recognition. This is a really, really important need. When you ask people why they want more money, they might say recognition. They might say to look after their family. But what most people say is to live, to survive. Well, maybe 20 years ago. But today, that's just a simple answer. When you say survive, what do you mean? Dig deeper. Ask questions. So she says that, the, that she... A pay rise would show her the recognition that she deserves. Pay will show the recognition. Now, what does recognition mean? You know, for Harry, recognition may mean means a face. For other people, recognition may mean uh, uh, an increase in job title or an award. Different people have different opinion for recognition. Think of the word professional. What does professional mean to one person? For one person, professional might mean wears a tie and a suit. For another person, it may mean knowledgeable. For another person, it may mean easy to communicate. So I don't know. So I ask. When you say recognised, what do you mean? Because I have my opinion, but what do you mean by recognised? This is an open question, but now it's becoming a leading question. I'm specifically asking the question about one theme, one topic. And that is uh, recognition. The employee says, I mean that I was doing overtime, working weekends and contributing more in meetings. I deserve a pay rise. Okay. Sounds like their opinion though, doesn't it? Ah, I see. And aside from this hard work, how did you fare in terms of your KPIs? Now, an HR manager knows that before any negotiation, you need to know the facts. So if this person is angry that they didn't hit their sales target or they didn't hit their KPIs, you need to know this before the meeting. And of course, in this example, the HR professional knows that this, cat, this employee did not hit their KPIs. But don't assume. Ask open questions. And that's why they still ask, how did you fare in terms of your KPIs? I already know that you didn't hit your KPIs, but what do you think? And this is an open leading question. Well, sure, I didn't hit my KPIs, says the employee. Oh, now, what we often do here is we start to assume and we start to diagnose and we start to say, well, that's because you didn't do that and that's because you didn't do that and you need to do this and you need to do that, but stop. Because this is a funnel technique. We're asking questions. We're not telling anybody. We want to get to the heart, the bottom of the course. And why do you think you were unable to hit your KPIs? Again, the HR manager probably knows why. Maybe they were late to work every day. Maybe they didn't have enough knowledge. Maybe they were lazy. But I'm not going to assume I want you to tell me. Um, I guess it's because I didn't know enough about our products, says the employee. Okay. Now we have a closed leading question. If I was able to arrange additional product knowledge training to help you reach this year's KPI, would you be interested in attending? Would you be interested in attending? That is a closed question. It has a yes or a no answer. Yes or no. The person says, well, sure, absolutely. That would be great. Okay, let's meet mid-year to see how you are faring. I am sure that you'll be able to hit your end-of-year KPIs and then we can reward you appropriately. Agree? Sure, I'll accept that. 
Now, that's a very romantic view of a negotiation, isn't it? Very perfect. No one got emotional. No one started crying. No one screamed. It's a, it's a perfect situation. But what the purpose of that sentence structure is to highlight how we are going to reach harmony. Harmony is not about avoiding confrontation. It is about confronting it. But it's also about not assuming why the other person is angry. Not assuming. And to not assume, you need to ask questions. But the problem is, Wendy, for 16 years, we are not taught to ask questions. We are taught to answer them. So this may seem very logical, and it is. But what it is hard, it is very hard to form a habit. So you need to start a habit. On your uh, boards back, back in your offices, start to write down the little symbol of a funnel. So that's the funnel. And in harmony, uh, in, in my life, um, in China, I've used this very successfully. And I mentioned to, Jeff, to, to everyone that I hired Jeff twice. There's no way that I could hire him back if I didn't know what his needs were. If I didn't ask him questions, if I didn't focus on the core issue, if I just assumed. Because Jeff is a very complicated person, right? <laughs> And, and, and I certainly, as I said, I'm no, I have no ability to guess what people are thinking. And if I did, I would not be standing here. I would be about 200 kilometers over there in Macau playing poker. So harmony. Harmony is about reaching a win-win, right? And you're not going to create a win-win if you haven't got a clue what the other person is thinking. So ask questions. And then you need to build um, build that into a need. So I'm now going to move away from the function internally and look at the function externally. Buying of services. And this leads us to the last part of today. We, as HR, are responsible for a fairly large and increasing cost center. Right? We have to employ people. We use recruiting companies. We outsource advertising uh, for, for those placements. We buy training services rather than build our own training uh, departments, which is good, I should add. And it's becoming very expensive. In fact, today, Chinese are more expensive, of course, than they were five years ago. In fact, there's, uh, in Asia, only, I believe it's um, Malaysia and Thailand are the only two countries that are still more expensive than China. Vietnam, Philippines, and the new economy that is beginning to grow just, just south of China, Myanmar or Burma. And you are going to lose business to these countries. That's a fact. As a Chinese employee, you need to make sure that you add value to the organization. Because uh, only last year, one of my American friends I've known for um, some, some around about nine years, he had a company in Shanghai and his headquarters were in California. And he closed his Shanghai, depart his Shanghai office because it was becoming too expensive. And do you know where he moved? Do you know where he moved to? His Shanghai company did not open in Vietnam, did not open in the Philippines, did not open anywhere in Asia. It moved to Missouri, USA. It moved into the heart of America because, as we all know, America is suffering a financial crisis. And an American is now often cheaper than a Chinese. Yeah? And you may be a bit confused and you may be thinking about your own salaries and thinking that's not accurate. But if you think about it, um, Americans only get two weeks holidays. Right? We get around about four weeks in China. Um, Sanjing, Sijing, Wujing those three, four, or five levels of social security are not offered in America. Right? The, the, the individual has to be responsible for them often in, in many cases. And of course, there is the issues faced with miscommunication. Americans talking to Americans don't have the miscommunication. Right? When they, and that was part of the problem, that things were being redone, um, repeated, because they didn't understand the first time. And of course, the last advantage is that there is only a one to two hour time difference between the East Coast and the middle of America. 
whereas there is a 12 to 16 hour difference between Shanghai and America. So as you can see, China is becoming more expensive. So what you need to do is you need to negotiate your vendors down. That's us. You need to get the best price. But to understand that, you need to understand why vendors, why companies like Cliff and my company, why we agree to discounts. Because we will. We will ad agree to a discount, but only if you're able to meet my need. And I'm going to show you a very important equation, which I learnt again back in Sanofi Aventus, and it is needs plus features equal benefits. In the last example, the employee's need was recognition. Means. And the feature of that was that the HR professional was able to offer training to help boost not only hit their KPIs, but give them recognition that they deserved. What are the needs of vendor companies that you deal with? Now don't think about tangible things, about things we can touch. Think about the intangible. What are the intangible needs that vendors have? Well, one of them, for many small companies, is a corporate green card. Now, what do I mean by a corporate green card? So for companies like TCL, or Lenovo, or Amazon, your brand is very strong, it's very, very established. In 2001, Clark Morgan's first client was Bayer, the German pharmaceutical company, a multinational pharmaceutical company. What was the price we offered? I can tell you right now, it was about 10% of what we charge today. About 10%. Why? Because we didn't have any other clients. But I knew that once we got one of these clients, like Bayer, we would be able to grow. And we did. Because Bayer offered us three advantages. Bayer is a multinational. Bayer is a German company. And Bayer is a pharmaceutical company. So once we got the corporate green card, like Shangwu uh, Luka, Lanka, right? the corporate green card, we were able to say to other companies who were multinational or German or pharmaceutical companies, we were able to say, hey, look, we train Bayer. We can train you, right? Because you're a German company or you're a pharmaceutical company or you're a multinational company. And from that day, our sales began to grow. And as soon as we got uh, a, a, a British company, we started targeting British companies. As soon as we got an American company, we started ch ch attacking and selling to American companies, and so on. So one is a corporate green card. What about cash flow? One of the things that Cliff and, and I know as a small business is that cash flow is the killer for small businesses. If you don't have a strong cash flow, if you delay salary, you reduce loyalty. And if you reduce loyalty in this environment with 19% turnover, you lose your best people. Maybe you're not lucky like me and get them back again. So cash flow can kill. So what can you do in HR? You can reduce the payment terms. I was talking to a, um, a fellow in Shanghai who works in the automotive industry, a French company. And they do a lot of engineering design. And they work with joint venture companies, companies like Daimler, uh, like Ford, like GM. And he said that one of his joint venture clients pays 523 days later. 523 days after the invoice is submitted. That's, that's one and a half years. Amazing. But he's lucky. His company is big. It has a very good turnover of cash. They have a lump sum. And so they're able to deal with this. So what's the longest term that you have? Is it 90 days? Is it 120 days? Could you reduce it? Could it be 30? Could it be 15? Could it be 5? And if it is, there's a benefit. And that benefit is to the vendor. And the vendor should offer you a discount. Thank you.